Okay. So I will continue from the concept of moles. Uh, we intro uh, we got introduced to the concept of mole in the last class. Okay, who's gonna do a real quick recap regarding the concept of mole? Who's gonna tell me what a mole is? Real quick, real quick. Okay. Yes, nobody? So if you don't know what a mole is, we cannot proceed further. Okay, Zainab, yes. I have unmuted you, yes. A mole is a unit which we use to measure things, like it's a basic unit. Okay. Yeah. Please elaborate on that a little more. That's not enough. Aisha, Nadeem, and Ajwa, come on. Hala, Laiba, Momina, come on. Somebody, what is a mole? Then I'm not going to proceed further because that means you don't know. You won't understand. Okay, Momina, yes? It is like a standard unit used to measure atoms. Um, okay, measure the number of atoms, you mean? Yes. Okay, so, um, so if I say one mole, does that mean one atom? Uh, like, um, no, yeah. it does not mean one atom. It's like a standard unit, like for measuring length, our standard unit is meters. Oh, so, okay. No, that's not a satisfactory answer. Atomic mass or formula mass expressed in grams? No, a unit for the amount that has the same number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12. No. Ariba, you are mixing atomic mass unit with mole. Uh, number of carbon atoms in? One twelfth of carbon twelve, that is the definition of atomic mass unit. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. A unit for the amount that has the same number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12. So, yeah, okay. So, you got okay, this definition is fine, but what did you understand out of this definition? I mean, I don't want ratified definitions. I want like simple, simple. If you ask me what a mole is and I give you this definition, Ariba, that you just gave me, will you understand? Okay, it is used for 6.02 into to 10 raised to the power 23 particles. Yes, now you're talking more sense, yes. So one mole means that we have 6.02 into 10 to the power 23 atoms, and that is called an Avogadro constant. So in one mole, that's how many atoms we are talking about, right? So I think I will have to recap. And kindly, kindly, this is my request, please read the background knowledge, you know, like read what we have covered in the last class. It, this is for your own benefit. Otherwise, you will just sit there, listen to me, I'll be gone, you'll be gone, and there will be no progress. Okay, so, what? Triple two five seven nine, triple two five seven nine. So, okay, triple two five seven nine is the, the password. Okay, so uh, one mole, remember one mole, has 6.02 into 10 to the power 23 number of atoms because it was it is very difficult to actually to to count the actual number of atoms so scientists came up with this uh, easier way of counting the number of uh, atoms and so one mole has this so i gave you an example of a spoonful like you know if i say add one spoon uh, of salt into the curry so one spoon, if you know the exact number of grains of salt in one spoon, you can exactly measure the number of grains that you're adding into the curry, right? So your one spoon 
is like one mole and the number of grains is like the number of atoms. Okay, please keep the door shut. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is uh, the concept of mole. And then uh, how to calculate the number of moles? How do you calculate the number of moles? How do you calculate the number of moles? What was the formula, remember? You know what, at the end of this, not even, uh, in fact, at the end of today's class, at the end of today's class, I will assign questions to students, okay, whether you like it or not. And if uh, students do not participate, uh, I will, you know, then there's problem. I will assign you questions and you will explain me, okay? I will, uh, and I want vo volunteers, I want students to come forward. I will give them questions at the end of this class, okay? And they will explain that question in the next class, okay? And I will assign at the, at the end of this class, okay? So uh, I gave you this analogy. If, for example, this is the whole substance, for example, okay? And now I wanna, uh, this is a jar of candies. And if I wanna calculate the number of candies in this, it would be very tedious and time consuming for me to take out each candy one by one and count them, right? So an easier way would be that if I can measure the mass of one candy, and if I measure the mass of this whole bottle jar, neglecting the mass of the bottle itself, and I divide that whole mass by the mass of this one candy, I can get the number of candies, right? That just makes sense, that simple, division, that simple mathematics, right? So now just, just consider candy as a mole. So number of candies would be the same as the number of moles. Mass of this whole jar would be the mass of the whole substance divided by the mass of one mole, okay? Uh, in our analogy, one sweet is one mole, okay? So, this was a recap. I had explained this to you in the last class. Yes, Hala, mass divided by the molecular mass will give you the uh, number of moles. And by the way, molecular mass and molar mass, same thing, same thing. When we talk about molecular mass, like we cannot measure the mass of one molecule alone. So we will be dealing with the molar mass. So for this chapter and for stoichiometry, this is called a stoichiometry. For stoichiometry purposes, all these masses that you have in the periodic table, these are all molar masses from now on, okay? We don't deal with individual atoms. We don't deal with individual mo molecules, but we deal with moles, okay? So from now onwards, this mass is not only the mass of one copper atom, but of the whole mole of copper, okay? And the units will be grams. Remember, molar mass is the same as the relative formula mass in grams. So when we deal with mass, molar mass, the unit changes from atomic mass unit. Remember, it was atomic mass unit when we were dealing with individual atoms, right? Now we're dealing with moles. So now the unit changed to grams. So don't be confused that, you know, how did the unit get to grams? Okay, so remember that uh, experiment that we did uh, of calculating, of you know, finding out the formula of magnesium oxide from that experiment. Remember this, this experiment, this experiment on page 155. So I will continue using the same example because we have done it already. So it would be easier for you to understand. I will use the same. Now today I will teach you inshallah ta'ala, how to calculate empirical formula from experimental uh, results, okay? Just like, you know, the magnesium oxide experiment, just like the magnesium oxide experiment. So let's begin with this, okay? Like this was the reaction, right? This was the reaction. This was the reaction right? Magnesium, keep the camera upright. This was the reaction we were dealing with. And also the mass of magnesium was 0.36 grams, mass of oxygen was 0.24 grams, and the mass of magnesium oxide was 0.6 grams, if you remember. 
If you do not remember, watch my previous classes uh, and then you can remember. So now we, if we know this information, if we have this information, how can we calculate its empirical formula? That's what we're gonna do today. Okay, first of all, what is a formula? First of all, what is a formula? So what are we trying to do? We are trying to find out the formula of magnesium oxide given this information. And where did we get this information from? From the experiment results. Okay, what is a formula? What is a formula? Who's gonna tell me? What is a formula? Uh, okay. Uh, you mass divided by the molar mass. Okay, what is a formula? The ratio in which elements are combined. Is it a ratio all the time? Is it a ratio all the time? Are all the formula telling us ratios? Are you sure? Yeah, Atika, no. So then, can you improve on this? What is a formula? It. Yes. I'm waiting. See. Yeah, it tells it, you know, formula is a short form, is a short handwriting to represent a compound or a simple element. And it gives us an idea regarding what elements are present and in what amounts, <coughs> in what amounts and in what proportions. Now, the formula are not always giving us ratio. There are two types of chemical formula we will be dealing with. One is called the empirical formula. The other is called the molecular formula. Now, what's the difference between the two? These words in one word, if you tell me, if you ask me to differentiate between them, that these are the words I will use. Molecular formula gives us the actual, the actual number of atoms of each type of element in a compound. Whereas an empirical formula, we get to know the ratio of the number of atoms of each element in a compound. Now, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? Let's talk a little, let's see some examples. For example, this is the actual molecule. This a phosphorus oxide. This is the actual, zoom in, P4O10. P4O10, okay, this is the actual molecular formula. That means, what is this telling us? about the molecule is that in one molecule, we have four atoms of phosphorus and 10 atoms of oxygen, right? But is this the empirical formula? Is it giving us the simplest whole number ratio? No. Empirical formula is what gives us the simplest whole number ratio of the atoms of different elements that are present in a compound. So just like in maths, divide the two numbers by any common factor. So four and 10 common factor is two. Two twos of four, two fives are 10. So the empirical formula would be P2O5. Now we, I cannot further simplify this, right? I cannot further simplify this. So this is the empirical formula. So um, this means that uh, this is the simplest, a uh, whole number ratio between phosphorus and oxygen in phosphorus oxide. So this is the empirical formula. Same is the case here, C10H22. So again, the common factor is uh, again two. And so I cancel two fives are 10, two 11s are 22, C5H11, and I cannot further simplify it. So this is my empirical formula, right? And so on and so forth. And I, you can go on doing with a lot of, substances with a lot, a lot of substances. Now, some, in some instances, both the molecular and the empirical formula can be the same, meaning that in actual molecule, the number of atoms do exist, already exist in the simplest ratio already. So you don't have to simplify anymore. So how do we know if a formula is uh, empirical or molecular? First thing that you will look at is that can they be simplified any further? No, if no, then most probably it is an empirical formula and maybe it is the molecular formula as well. But how will we further uh, verify if that is the molecular formula as well? Then experimentally, we will find out the molecular mass. 
experimentally, we will find out the molecular mass. If the molecular mass is the same as the molecular mass that you find using the empirical formula, that means the empirical and molecular formula are the same. And if the molecular formula is greater than the mass that you would calculate using the empirical formula, then that means the molecular formula is different from empirical formula. Okay, so experimentally, you have to verify. So for example, this molecule, this is the molecular formula and this is the empirical formula. Okay, so if I have calculated this empirical formula experimentally, I will find out that the molecular mass is twice this, twice this. Why? Because the mole actual molecule is this. So all the numbers are twice, right? Two times nitrogen, two times oxygen. So the molecular mass would be twice the mass that I would calculate using empirical formula, right? So this is what I mean. So now, if you have understood what the difference between molecular and empirical formula, now let's get back to the, that experiment. So empirical formula tells us uh, the simplest and whole number ratio of the number of moles of different elements in a compound. Now remember, even within the formula, when we are talking about the uh, atoms in the formula, we are actually talking in terms of moles, okay? So, uh, so even within the same compound, within the same molecule of a compound, in calculations, we will deal with the number of moles. So in this formula, I would say that one mole of magnesium with one mole of oxygen. So the molar ratio is one is to one. And how did we find that out? Now, let's see. So this is my equation, okay? And remember, these numbers in equations, these are called coefficients, coefficients. And these smaller subscripts that we use, these all represent the ratio of the number of moles, remember, which also translates to the ratio of the number of atoms, okay? But for our calculation purposes, they are depicting or representing the ratio of the number of moles, okay? So now, if I know the mass of magnesium and I know the mass of oxygen, and I know the molar mass. Molar mass is what I got from the periodic table. If I have these two pieces of information, then I can use this formula. Number of moles is mass divided by the molar mass. And I, the mass I got experimentally 0.36. I divided that 0.36 grams by the molar mass of magnesium, which was 24. And so I got 0.015. That means 0.015 moles of magnesium reacted with oxygen. Now, how many moles of oxygen reacted? So I know the mass of oxygen. Again, mass divided by the molar mass. Molar mass I got from the periodic table. Uh, and so, again, I got the same uh, number of moles, okay? Now, remember, we are dealing with elements here so we will use the uh okay so okay so now the ratio is one is to one okay the ratio is one is to one so what uh, how will i translate that into a formula that means one magnesium reacting with one oxygen okay so the formula is magnesium oxide right okay so this is how we got to the formula from this given information, right? Okay, let me verify this. 0.25 divided by 16 is 0.015. Okay, 0.36 divided by 24 is 0.015. Okay, okay. So I hope you understood how I got the formula for magnesium oxide. Now this is an empirical formula which also happens to be the molecular formula, okay? Because this is, now this is an ionic salt, this is an ionic compound, so it will exist as a giant lattice, right? What is a giant lattice? What is a giant lattice? Okay, Huda Chishti, I cannot repeat such a, because then, then I'll be doing only this. 
where you get molar mass? I got the molar mass from the periodic table. Uh, can molecular formula be simplified? If it can be simplified, it will turn into an empirical formula. It will no longer be a molecular formula. But if the actual molecule has the same number of atoms as in the empirical formula, then yes, both a molecular and empirical formula would be the same. Okay. Uh, does water apply to this? But why not in H2O2? Okay, yeah, that's a good question, Amina. That why don't we simplify H2O2? That's a very good question. No. Or oh, maybe, maybe. I, I, I. Yes. Yeah, you are right, Sundos. Yes, Sundos is saying that the empirical formula for H2O2 should be HO. I will have to look into this and verify. I think she's right, theoretically speaking. Theoretically speaking, it might be the empirical formula for hydrogen peroxide. This is hydrogen peroxide. But remember, one point that I forgot to mention is that whenever you are writing formulae, okay, whenever you are writing formulae, you have to verify does that molecule actually exist? Because you see, uh, nature does not follow our calculations. Our calculations follow nature, okay? It's the other way around. So before coming to a conclusion through your calculations, verify if that molecule actually exists. So no such molecule exists. H-O, no such molecule exists. So this can be a hypothetical, you know, like a theoretical empirical formula. I will verify. But basically, this is the formula. Okay, this does not exist. Okay. Okay, is there any other question? How will we calculate molecular mass for diatomic elements? Multiply by the, you know, like get the, uh, didn't we do calculation of relative formula mass? Did we do that? Calculation of, yes, we did, I remember. Yusra, uh, 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 what you're asking is how to calculate relative formula mass, right? Yeah, so that is the molecular mass, okay? Uh, for diatomic elements or whatever elements. Okay, Ajwa, lattice is a three-dimensional arrangement of the molecules in a solid. Yes, three-dimensional ordered structure. They uh, follow a particular periodic pattern. Why did I use the word periodic? Meaning repeating patterns. Okay, that's what a lattice is. So magnesium oxide, just like sodium chloride and most of the other ionic salts, uh, they exist in the form of a lattice, right? Regular and repeating pattern, right? Uh, Chishti, if you have problem understanding how to calculate this, uh, replay the recording of this video, okay? When I post in the group, okay? Okay, because if I repeat, I will not be able to do anything else, okay? So, uh, and that's the good part of having online classes and recording them is that you can replay them and, you know, listen to them again and again, as much as you want at your leisure. Okay, so, okay. So this is what we did. Now, let's move on to how to find the empirical formula from Percentage by mass data. Okay, another thing. Molecular formula should be found out by experiments and then empirical formula can be calculated. Okay, usually that's how it is. Why is molecular formula found out by experiments? Because that's how the molecules, because in experiments, you will be dealing with the actual molecules that exist in nature. So the results of your experiment are going to yield, are going to give you molecular mass or molecular formula, molecular mass from which you can derive molecular formula. And then by simplifying the ratio, you can get the empirical formula. Because of course, the atoms don't exist in this form. I mean, the molecules, the atoms in the molecules, their number, their, you know, the ratio of the number does not exist in this. This is for our calculations. We have done this. This is the actual this is the actual form in which the atoms within the molecules exist. This is that, 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 that's called molecular formula. Okay, so now how to find the empirical formula given the percentage by mass in questions. So yeah, like, you know, you will be given questions like this, for example. This was, I, by the way, I took this from your book. Now, 
in the question, for example, they will give you that silicon is 47% of its compound, oxide compound. What is the empirical formula, for example? This is, you know, like I simplified the question. So now what are the pieces of information from this question? That there are, now because the suffix is "-ide", so I know there are only two different types of elements, okay? Now, because it's oxide, so that means my anion should be oxygen, and there is silicon, so silicon should be the other element, right? So this much I know, but I need to find what are the subscripts here, right? That's what the question is asking. What is the empirical formula? And empirical means that these will be in their simplest whole number ratios. Okay, now we know that percentage is a ratio, right? We all know that. And it means out of 100, right? It tells how much out of 100. So now 47% means 47 out of 100, right? Now following the ratio method, if I say 47 out of 100, I will assume that the total molecular mass will be represented, represented by 100. And 47 out of that is the mass of silicon. Did you understand that? So if I assume, and I'm like, I'm like using the ratio method. So if out of 100, 47 is silicon, then whatever the molecular mass of the whole compound is, how much silicon in that? Something like that. Okay, I hope you understood. So 100 is representing the whole molecular mass, whatever it is. We, we don't know it yet. But out of whatever that is, 47% is silicon, that much we know. So now considering, now I, for my, the, for my calculation and especially for uh, calculations dealing with percentage, remember, you will equalize molecular mass of the whole compound as 100 because you are dealing with ratio. The whole molecular mass will be equal to 100. So if the whole molecular mass of this is 100, I'm assuming it to be 100 because I don't know. So I'm, I'll, I'm using ratio. So if the mass of the whole molecule is 100, 47 is silicon. So the remaining must be the other element. The remaining must be the other element. So if this is 47, this should be 100 minus 47, which is 53. Only, only then 53 plus 47 would give me 100. So that's what I assumed, right? Now, using this, that means oxygen is 53%. Am I correct if I say that oxygen in this compound is 53% if silicon is 47%? So then that means, this is my conclusion. If I'm taking 100 to be the total molecular mass, 47 is silicon, 53 is oxygen. Right. Now, remember, this is the ratio of mass but mass ratio is not we will is not what we use for our calculations mass ratio is not what we use in our calculations why only in situations when the mass ratio is the same as the mole ratio some instances some situations mass ratio is the same as molar ratio in such instances yes you can use but mostly to be on the safe side because you don't know when that situation is true. Always, always use molar ratio. Never di directly use the ratio of the masses. And I will explain you in detail why. Now I will take out the number of moles. Why? Why am I taking out the number of moles? Because I wanna find out the molar ratio in the compound. I wanna find out the molar ratio in the compound, right? I have to find out the empirical formula. So the number of moles, again, same formula, mass divided by the molar mass. Mass is 47 from my percentage, remember? Okay, 47 divided by the molar mass of silicon is 28. And then mass of 53, remember? 100 minus 47 was 53. So 53 divided by 16 is the molar mass of oxygen. And these are my answers. So I got 1.68 and 3.3. Now. This is not enough. I mean, this would be like writing, this would be like writing this, 1.68, 3.3.
what does that mean? Like 1.68 atoms of silicon and 3.3 atoms of oxygen? No, atoms don't exist as fractions. Atoms don't, they exist as whole, right? So we want whole numbers. So in order to get the whole numbers, we will find out the ratio. Now, there are two methods of finding out ratio. You will try both of them. You will keep trying till you get whole numbers. How will you do that? The first method is divide the numbers by the smallest of all the numbers. For example, 1.68, 3.3. 1.68 is smaller, right? So I divide both of them by 1.68. If I divide both of them by 1.68, I would get one and I would get 1.96, which is almost two. So it's safe to take it as two. So that means the ratio is one is to two. That means one silicon for two oxygen, uh, one silicon atom for two oxygen atoms, okay? Okay, so this is our final formula. Okay, I will also talk about the other method of finding out the ratio. Okay, sometimes dividing by the smallest does not give you the, you know, the whole numbers. Also remember, you can round about only till 0.9 or 0.8. But if you get smaller than this, for example, if my answer would have been 1.7, I cannot round it to two. It's not accurate. So, so if the decimal point it gets, you know, like, uh, I don't know, how should I say this? If the decimal point is a smaller than eight, you cannot round it off to two because, yeah, it, in this case, in case of empirical formula, you cannot do that. Okay, so that is why I am telling you a second method of how to find the ratio. If you don't get, if you don't get a whole number ratios, what is the other way? You keep multiply, you multiply or you divide by simple numbers, starting from two onwards, till you get whole numbers, both the, in, with both of them, okay? One way is to divide by the smallest number. The other way is you either multiply or you divide by simple numbers, starting from two, till you get both whole numbers. And then I found this out, a shortcut method. If you have these digits after the decimal, if you have 0.25, try multiplying by four, you'll get whole numbers. If you have 0.50, 50 as the digits after decimal, try multiplying by two, you'll get whole numbers. 0.66 multiply by three, you will get 0.99 something or 0.98 something. So you can easily round it off to whole number. Again, same is the case here, 0.33. If you multiply by three, you will get whole numbers, 0.75 multiply by four, okay? You can save it somewhere, this helps, okay, to get the whole numbers because sometimes it's difficult to get the whole numbers you don't seem to get. And when you round off, you get the wrong ratio and therefore the formula gets wrong. So do you want me to recap this a little bit? Okay, let me recap because I know this is a new concept and a little complicated. So let me do a real quick recap. So in the question, they gave us the percentage for silicon. We had to find out, find out the empirical formula. So because it was a percentage, subtracting from 100 got me the percentage for oxygen. And so because this is a ratio, I used this ratio directly to find out using this a formula for the number of moles. I found out the ratio between the number of moles. I simplified and I got one is to two. And that's how I got the formula, okay? This is how you calculate the empirical formula from percentage mass. Again, that can also be derived from experiments, okay? Okay, before I move on, let me check your questions from the chat window. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. But when we draw structures, we do by empirical. No, when we draw molecular structures, uh, we follow the molecular formula, empirical, because that's not how they exist. So what's the point of drawing them? Well, you can if you need to, but we usually don't. 
okay uh yes okay can molecular formula be simplified atika uh, a molecular formula can be simplified but then it will turn into an empirical formula okay so that's what empirical formula is simplified molecular formula yeah that's another way of of uh, explaining uh, empirical formula simplified molecular formula this is assumption or fact the 47 and 53 thingy <laughs> i have a question Uh, uh, this is not an assumption this is ratio method okay so yeah this is i, I think you're talking about this you're talking about that this is not my assumption this is ratio yeah you if you if you're calling ratio assumption well you can but yeah this is ratio so yes i'm assuming but i this is an is this is an uh, calculated educated assumption you can call okay okay Okay, Miss, can you explain this last question, second method again? Last question, second method: multiplying or dividing by simple numbers till you get whole numbers or near whole numbers. You know, like point eight, point nine. What does empirical mean? Can you explain the decimal part again? I don't get it. What decimal part? Uh, uh, how did you get forty-seven over twenty-eight? Who is asking this? Amra Javed. Where did the 16 and 28 come from? These are molar masses. Molar masses, same as the uh, masses given in the periodic table. Okay. Okay, Amna, go ahead. Ask the question. Do you want me to unmute you? This decimal thing is that what you're asking? Yeah. So this is. i just gave you this is just a you know this is like a tip and trick this is like a this is like a tip so if you we you don't know, when we will solve past paper questions when we will do calculation and i will give you calculation i will assign you that 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 that's what i said at the end of this class i am going to give you questions and i want vo volunteers if you don't volunteer then yeah then i i will not be happy okay so how to get whole numbers so i just gave you a tip and trick and you will better understand this when you solve questions okay when you get a number with these two digits after decimal try multiplying by 4 to get the whole number that's what i'm saying if you get 0.50 try multiplying by 2 to get the whole number and 0.6 is so yeah that that's what i was saying that's all Okay I'm glad Atika what is the symbol bt what bt yeah sometimes i use a uh, short cuts but bt due to 1.96 oh 1.962 oh you are you asking this so this means like almost equal this means almost equal this symbol it means almost equal so 1.96 or this is actually 1.97 is almost equal to 2 okay okay huh uh good job hala very good i appreciate it hala uh, vo volunteer to solve a question good job hala and please don't be scared of making mistakes if you don't make mistakes and by the way people who don't make mistakes don't learn If you if you don't make mistake, that means you're not learning. And Sundus will also uh, uh, solve a question. In fact, if I get time, I'll make her solve right now. Okay, Momina, very good. Yes, Yusra. Okay, individually message me. I will individually send you questions. Very good. Yes. Okay, Amna, you want me to unmute you? Okay, Amna. Yes. Yes, Amna. Yes. No, you solved my question. So, oh, I solved your question. Okay, good. Okay. Will we have classes in vacations? Inshallah, for as long as I can. But I cannot guarantee anything. But for as long as I can, happily, I will try my best. But okay, I don't want you to look at the answers, so I'm hiding. Okay, tell me what is a salt. so we will we are doing hydrated salts okay and we will be learning how to 
calculate the percentage of water or if the percentage of water is given, how to find out the ratio of water in, um, in hydrated salts, the ratio between the salt and the water in the hydrated salt. So first of all, who will tell me what is a salt? And this is a grade six question. This is a grade six question. You know, people who think that, uh, you know, grade six is too low for them. Okay. Uh, it is an ionic compound. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, Sundus. Tell it loudly. Please tell. Metal and non-metal uh, bonded with each other. Uh, yes. An ionic compound. Very good. Okay, good job, Hania. Good job. Yes. So, yes, most of you also answered correctly. Metal, reacting with non-metal, giving uh, cations and anions, right? And usually the cation comes from the base and anion comes from the acid, right? Now, what are hydrated salts? Very good, Hala. Yes, the, uh, salts are usually the end products of neutralization reactions. So acid plus base give us salt, okay? So, but even if they are not made of neutralization reactions, but they do have the cation and the anion, usually they are from neutralization, but yes, cations and anions. Okay, now what do we mean by hydrated? Hydrated is easy. So it has, yes, it has water of crystallization. So what does that mean? Can you elaborate a little more? What does water of crystallization mean? Is it the same as dissolving in water? Then what's the difference between a salt solution and a hydrated salt? Huh? Loudly, loudly. Hydrated is in which there's, they are a bit moist or they're around the molecule. Yeah, you, 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 you can't actually keep your finger on it. Like you know it, but you don't know how to pinpoint it. So what's the difference between solution and a hydrated salt? Uh, an ionic compound in which a number of water molecules are attracted by the answer, therefore enclosed within its crystal lattice. Ha ha, Google kar kar ke yaan dalo. <laughs> Google kar ke aur yaan par yaan par copy paste karo. <clears throat> Uh, they have water bonded in their molecules. Yes, Saad Ahmed, you are very close. The water molecules are bonded in their molecules in a fixed ratio. If you had just added that, then your answer would have been perfect. Saad Ahmed, water that have bonded to the molecule, not molecules, but yes, the ionic, the you know salt, the crystalline salt unit. Why am I not calling it molecule? Because they form they. There are two sorts of giant lattice, and I think you have done this in grade six or seven. There are two types of giant lattice. One is ionic, the other is covalent, right? Right, so um, in both the cases, we don't use the word molecule because the molecule term is for the simple molecules which exist separate which exists separately, like carbon dioxide, oxygen, sulfur dioxide. We, use, we usually use the term molecule for those simple covalent molecules. But otherwise, if you have a giant lattice, be it covalent or ionic, they are called giant structures, okay? And we use the uh, term formula unit. What do I mean by that? I'll ex elaborate on that a little bit. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, uh, so uh, what do I mean by giant lattice? For example, I'm showing you a silicon dioxide giant lattice. This, this, so can you see it's a giant lattice and they have circled the, uh, the unit which is repeating itself. So you know, like how you have a pattern and there's one unit which is repeating itself, you know, in patterns. So it is SiO2, which is the formula unit, which is repeating itself. So the, the formula that we will use for this substance is SiO2. That does not mean that SiO2 is a simple molecule. No, it is a part of giant lattice, but that's the formula for its repeating unit. So therefore it's called formula unit, okay? Same is the case with sodium chloride. 
Same is the case with magnesium oxide and all of ionic compounds that exist as giant lattice. So I hope you understood that point. Um, okay, so, okay, so, sorry. So the difference between solution and a hydrated salt is in hydrated salt, you have fixed number of water molecules which are loosely attached to the salt crystal. Now I want to, I, I hope you understand the meaning of fixed, right? For example, I will give you copper sulfate pentahydrate. Pentahydrate. Penta means five molecules of water attached to each copper sulfate. Again, this is ionic and giant lattice. Ionic giant lattice, but with each repeating unit, you have five molecules of water attached. I will show you a picture of how that happens. So with each repeating unit of copper sulfate, this is also ionic, we have five molecules of water attached. This ratio is fixed. One is to five. One is to five. This ratio is fixed, okay? In solution, you don't have a fixed ratio. Like you can increase or decrease the number of molecules of water, the amount of water. So that's the difference between solution and hydrated salts. In hydrated salts, you have a fixed ratio of water to salt. Whereas in solution, you don't have a fixed ratio. Okay, it's variable. It depends upon how much water you have added. Okay, crystal means particles arranged in a repeated pattern in three dimensions. So now let me show you copper sulfate pentahydrate. Because if you know what you, I'm talking about, it's better, it's easier for you to understand. This is, so, okay, a bit, no, before I show you this, I want to show you this, because then otherwise you won't understand. So can you see the copper at the center? Okay. And then that copper is ionically, ionically means due to uh, attraction of b b between opposite charges. Attraction between opposite charges, copper is ionically bonded to sulfate, right? They, in this particular di uh, diagram, they have shown two sulfates, but the repeating unit consists of only one copper and one sulfate. The other sulfate is a part of the other repeating unit. Now, can you see four molecules of water are bonded to copper two plus ion at this in the center in the same plane? And they have drawn this plane to make you realize that all the four water molecules are in the same plane, just like, you know, four corners of a paper. And then the fifth molecule is right on the side, right side. Can you see? So each repeating unit of copper sulfate has five molecules of water bonded to it this way. Now also notice that the ionic bond is represented by solid lines, whereas the attraction between copper and water is represented by dotted lines. Why is that? Because this bond is um, this bond is unique. Now let me talk about this bond a little bit. This bond is stronger than the intermolecular forces, but weaker than intramolecular forces. Now inter means between molecules. You know, like you have hydrogen bonds in water, and then you have other. Uh, uh, intramolecular forces of attraction between the molecules. Now, this bond is stronger than those uh, sorts of intramolecular forces, but this bond is weaker than the ionic or the covalent. These are the two types of bonds that you find within the molecule or within the formula if you're talking about giant structures, right? So, I hope you understood this. So, this bond like lies somewhere in between the intra and inter, okay, in terms of a strength, okay? <clears throat> and that is why, you know, the ratio is fixed because they are stronger than inter, okay? So now once you have understood this, now you can easily understand this. So can you see the red ball at the center is the copper ion, the two yellow ones are the sulfates, and then you can see that four water molecules surrounding the copper at the same plane, like four corners of a paper, and then the fifth one lying on the right side, fifth water molecule. This is another picture, just look at this, and then we'll be done, yeah.
Can you see? Same picture. Copper at the center, sulfate up, sulfate down, and then four water molecules surrounding copper and the fifth one on the right side. Right. So this was copper sulfate pentahydrate. Okay. Now, so if we know now how to calculate the ratio between the salt and the water in a hydrated salt, how, how to do that? Now we need, uh, 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 what pieces of information do we need to calculate this? We should know the total mass of the salt, okay? We should know either the mass of salt or the water. The total mass, we should know the total mass and one of these. And then it's easier, it's very easy to find the third one. So if we know the, 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 the total mass, and if we know one of these, we can easily find the, find the three things. So these are the three things we should know. Mass of salt without water, mass of water, and the mass of the whole thing. Okay, and then we can calculate the ratio. Now let's do this example so that you know what I mean. So I have copper sulfate, five grams of hydrated copper two sulfate crystals. So hydrated means there are water molecules. Together, they are five grams. Experimentally, what I will do is, I will take that five grams, I will heat it thoroughly. Make sure you don't damage the crystals. So the heating should be very gentle and most, prob I mean, uh, preferably in a water bath and all of that. I did not show that. So at the end, you are left with 3.2 grams. So making, so, so assuming that the heating is complete and all the water molecules have left, we will assume that this is the mass of salt without water. So this is anhydrous because all the water molecules have left due to evaporation or you know due to heating. Okay. So this is the total. This is anhydrous. So the difference between the two would give us water, right? Because water is what left. Leaving of water is what gave us this difference. So five minus 3.2 gave us 1.8 grams. So that was the mass of water. So 3.2 was anhydrous. So copper sulfate itself, anhydrous was 3.2. Water was 1.8. Now, again, I will use the number of moles, okay? Mass divided by the molar mass. How did I get this molar mass? Calculate the relative formula mass of copper sulfate. Get the masses of copper, sulfur, oxygen from the periodic table. Multiply the atomic mass of oxygen by four. Add them up, you'll get 160. Water, 18. Number of moles, 0 0.02, 0.1. So I use that method of dividing by the smallest number. 0.02 was, was a smaller. I divided both of them by 0.02 and the ratio I got is one is to five which is the same as the formula, right? One is to five. For one salt of copper sulfate, we have five. One mole of copper sulfate, we have five moles of water. All right, now uh, we have only eight minutes left. I want to emphasize on why we cannot use mass ratio directly and why do we have to calculate the number of moles before we you know, calculate the formula and all of that. Remember. The numbers in equations and formulae, they represent the, the number of moles of each substance or element, okay? Not their mass. Because the molar mass of each element is different. Mass ratio is not equal to molar ratio, why? Because, for example, I will explain you with the help of this example. For example, if I have 12 grams of carbon and I have 12 grams of hydrogen, so the molar, the mass ratio is, mass ratio is one is to one because both carbon and hydrogen are 12 grams, right? Mass ratio is one is to one. But if I calculate the number of moles, I will divide the mass by the molar mass, mass by the molar mass, and this is what I will get, one is to 12. So can you see that the mass ratio is one is to one, but the molar ratio is one is to 12. So they are definitely not the same. And formulae and equations represent the number of moles, not the mass. That is why mass ratio is not used, molar ratio is used 
But in some cases, mass ratio is equal to molar ratio. In some cases, in those cases, you can use, but you don't know when that is true and when that is not true. So proper way of doing it is molar ratio. Okay. And so I have five minutes left. Um, just a quick question. Tell me, this heating of copper, uh, let me heat this, this, this heating of hydrated copper sulfate salt into copper sulfate and water, is this a chemical or a physical change? And also give your reasons. If I heat this hydrated salt into this, is this chemical or physical and why? Physical as no new substance is produced, physical, physical. Can we do mass ratio also? Shahid, I just explained everything, Re replay my video. No, you cannot use mass ratio. Uh, so, Miss, a white powder is left. Oh, I think you're talking about copper sulfate being heated. Yes, a white powder is le uh, left. Yes, Amina, we will do practice questions. Don't worry. Okay. No, this is not a physical change. This is a chemical change. Yeah, because it can be converted back if heated. Yes. Well, well, yes, but I'm sorry to disappoint you. This is a chemical change. Yeah, the reason is, these are the reasons. Yeah. The, the, remember these bonds that I just showed you? They were somewhere in between intra and inter, right? So now chemical changes when a molecule changes, right? When a molecule changes. Now in this, can we consider this as one molecule? Can we, can we consider this as one molecule? Now, the answer to that question would be, does the ratio of atoms stay constant within this unit? Yes, it does. So that does make it one molecule. I mean, you know, like one formula unit. And if that is changing, if that is changing, this is a chemical change. Do you understand? Yes, it is confusing. I was also confused. And that's why this is not a part of your book. This is not a part of this chapter. But I was intrigued and I searched on it and this is what I found out. And you can also go ahead and search. So because this is one unit and this is acting as a molecule, I mean like one unit for that substance, because why, how, how do I know that it is acting as one unit? Because the ratio is so fixed. We are actually doing calculations to find out. The ratio is so fixed that we can actually doing is stoichiometric calculations to find the ratio between the water molecules and salt. So this is so fixed and you are changing that. This is no longer fixed. So that is why uh, 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 this is a chemical change. This is like a type of decomposition. This is acting as one unit, giving, giving you two different units. Another thing, there are chemical and physical differences between the anhydrous and the hydrated salt. Go ahead, Google search and you'll find out. They differ in their appearance. This is blue, this is white. This can attract water molecules. This can absorb water mo mo molecules. This cannot. They differ in their physical and chemical properties. So this is a chemical change, right? So. Uh, if it was salt solution and you're evaporating into this, that could be called a physical change because there was no fixed ratio. There was no formula unit you were breaking. Here, you're not breaking any formula unit. So this is physical change, okay? But this is chemical. Okay, um, let me check your chat window. This was an interesting question and the explanation was pretty cool too. <laughs> yes, yes, Aisha. And you know what, this was not a part of your chapter, but when I was doing this, this question, you know, came into my mind. That's why, you know, I encourage all of you to teach. Please, uh, I will give you questions now, okay? Uh, because, you know, this chat window is not saved with me. This chat is not saved with me. Contact me privately. I will give you questions 
from the end of uh, end of chapter questions from this book as well as from um, this you know this website that dr roma uh, shared with you guys 8a girls from that website i i got a few questions and i will assign those questions from you and you will explain okay i will also allow you to share your screen if you want and then we will discuss and it's okay to go wrong it's okay to make mistakes from mistakes we learn okay and sundas will do that as well okay because i'm running out of time so sundas did not get a chance to solve today but inshallah in the next class you and sundas will together solve questions right okay assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh contact me i would like a question okay what is that question okay amra javed Okay, whoever wants to leave can leave. Amra wants to ask a question. Okay, let me unmute you. Yes, I have unmuted you. You're not getting unmuted. <laughs> 